gonna go to a- oh shit. I'm gonna go to Amoeba right now, guys. I'll be right back. Two hours later. Alright, I got the goods. Hello, Internet. This is Olin from what I'm listening to. It is that time again. It is time for another edition of New Editions. This seems to be an ongoing series of vlogs that I've made. Um, basically, go to Amoeba, buy some stuff, come back, talk about it. They're all in the patented lunchbox here. Um, not much else to say. Let's see what kind of new stuff I'm adding to my collection today. Put it right over here. Easy access. I said that kind of funny. All right, the first album from the lunchbox here. I have Joanna Newsom's Ease. It's not every day that an album will grab me and I will end up listening to it multiple times over the span of a few days. Usually I will listen to an album and immediately move on to the next one, but that was not the case with this album. It's honestly pretty amazing how long it took me to finally listen to Joanna's music. I've known about her for way too long, but when it came to actually hunkering down and listening to at least one of her records, I just never did so. Part of it was the fact that she is a harp player. Uh, there was something about that that kind of turned me off. Nothing against her as a musician, and nothing against the harp. It's just not every day you have somebody who is in the mainstream who plays harp. Coupled with the fact that from what I had heard by her, she had a very strange vocal delivery, which, again, was kind of a turnoff for me. And I can't quite remember what actually got me to check this album out, but at some point down the line, I did. And the moment I heard the song Emily, which is the first track on this CD, I was hooked. Ease is beyond what I expected this to be. It was beyond just standard harp pop music that I thought it initially was. It is so much bigger, there's so much amazing poetry to it, the music is brilliant, the production is brilliant, the atmosphere, everything about this is just excellent. And to go even further, the people involved in the recording of this album are people I also really, really love and respect. Steve Albany ended up recording Joanna's vocals and harps, Jim O'Rourke ended up doing the mixing for the album, and Van Dyke Parks ended up being the person behind all the orchestration. It's just too good to pass up, and I cannot believe it took me so damn long to get this album. So after listening to this for, god, a whole entire week, I've decided I had to add it to the collection. I have it now, I'm so excited to. Who knows, maybe one of these days, once I get away from this album, I'll go and check out the rest of her discography, and maybe I'll talk about them in a future video. But until then, I will be listening to this one a lot more times now that I have it. If the meteorite is the source of the light, and the meteor is just what we see. And the meteoroid is a stone that's devoid of the fire that propelled it to thee. The next album in the box here, uh, I have Basements Beside Myself. What a good song. What have you done? A something left it makes me really happy to see that there are bands like Basement out there. Their whole purpose is to make angsty and thought-provoking 
and self-reflecting punk music. And you know, when I was 15 or 16, we had bands like Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco who are still around, but they have significantly moved away from that kind of emo sound and are doing art pop kind of sounding stuff. But this is just showing that the pop punk or post hardcore, whatever you want to call it, this kind of music is still alive and well. And there are people that are making it for other kids out there who need it. And I think it's easy for a lot of adults or a lot of millennials who are kind of beyond that kind of music to laugh it off or completely discredit it. For me, I still like the stuff. And again, as I said, I respect them for making this kind of music. And the funny thing is, is I actually saw these guys live about a year ago when they were opening for the Front Bottoms. At that time, I didn't really think anything of them. To me, they were just another super angsty punk band that was really getting the crowd going. But as far as their music went, I just didn't really care for them. I was mostly there for the front bottoms. Eventually down the line, they released this album, and I decided to check it out just because I'd seen them live, and maybe their music translated better to a studio sound than a live sound. And upon my first listen of this album, I honestly really was not very blown away by it. I liked it, and I enjoyed the listen, but I just... It was kind of forgettable to me. But gradually over time, this album snuck up on me, and I found myself getting a couple of the songs on here stuck in my head, all the way to the point where now I've come to the conclusion that yes, I like this album. And the fact that I found it for a mere $4.99 today at Amoeba was even more of a reason to pick it up. Some of my favorite tracks on here are the first song, Disconnect, uh, Be Here Now is a good one, and Personal favorite of mine is Stigmata. The main guitar riff and the melody of that song is so dark and so sinister, and it just completely reminds me of all the kind of emotional music that I was listening to when I was a teenager. So kudos to Fueled by Ramen for putting this one out. I'll have to check out the rest of this band's discography and see what that's all about, but until then, I'll re-listen to this one a couple more times. album I have for you here is a bit of an obscure release. Uh, I have an album by a dude named Lauren Chase. As most of you probably already know, I am a big experimental music fan. And over the years, I've accumulated a lot of fantastic experimental CDs in my collection. In that same vein, I am also a big fan of field recording albums. Basically, they are albums containing recordings taken from, well, a field. It could be taken from a city, a forest, a river, even outer space. At some point down the line, I do want to make a vlog dedicated to the field recording albums I have here in my collection, but for now, let's just start by talking about this. This album, I actually don't really know a whole lot about. I stumbled across this guy's work while browsing Bandcamp one night, and I was pretty interested in what he had. He's got a lot of different projects under a lot of different names, all kind of doing the same stuff, but in some different shape. This album I actually happened to put on my wish list on Bandcamp. I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to buy it digitally or if I was just going to buy the CD copy of it on Discogs, but Amoeba happened to have the CDR copy in their clearance section, so complete no-brainer. And I know what some of you are thinking, why would you buy an album that has no music and just recordings of ambience? Well, I love albums like these for that exact reason. I am just a big fan of sound in general. Sure, there's ambient music out there, which the purpose of it is to make those kind of recordings in the form of music. So there's at least some kind of melody and some sort of enjoyable factor to it. 
But this is just the straight up ambience. It's just great stuff to have on, whether you need something calming to listen to or something to put on in the background. It, it's just kind of nice to have. It's like those machines that you can buy that are used for calming you down or trying to get you to fall asleep. It's all on this album. And I think with this record, it's recordings of a forest, a river, all that, and slightly repurposed to have some drone and some experimental electronic elements to it. But overall, it's a straight up field recording album, and I'm really, really excited to have this. At some point down the line, I will sit down and make a field recording vlog. Uh, but until then, I will be zoning out to this one a lot. The next album I have from the box here is actually some brand new music. Uh, I have Hobo Johnson's The Fall of Hobo Johnson. If I think of me, it makes me take it now, it now. But if I die before I break, I won't mind, I'm yours to take. And if I go to hell, then I will think of you while in the fire. And everything will be okay, just the thought of you. And these burning flames. I know I've talked about Hobo in some vlog a while ago, and I know that in said vlog, I raved about this guy. At this point in Hobo's life, he signed on to a major label, he's got a full band, and he's thriving. And I could not be happier to see that he has been doing so well. In the beginning, he was living in his car, working at a pizza joint, and just trying to make music whenever he could get his hands on the equipment. He put out an amazing debut album that was both hilarious and heartbreaking. In fact, I think it was even reissued on Reprise, so you can get it pretty easily. But this is the follow-up album. This is the first album he's putting out on Reprise on his major label with his full band. It's incredibly exciting. I purposefully haven't listened to a whole lot off this album because I want to experience it all in one sitting, but the stuff I have actually sampled, I've liked. It's definitely a bigger sound and a bigger production compared to the simpler productions on his previous album, but I'm really looking forward to checking this one out. Who knows, maybe it'll end up in my top 10 of 2019. I'm not sure. Anything's possible. I'm gonna feel alone forever. I'm gonna feel alone forever! But I'm getting used to the thought. Except late at night, you know, maybe I'm not. All right, Internet, the last album I have for you today, I have Suicide's The Second Album. Mr. Ray. Hey, hey. I bought this album for two different reasons. The first being, I love the band Suicide. I have their first album on both CD and vinyl and cannot get enough of it, so it was only appropriate to get the second one. But the main reason I bought this album and want to talk about it today is to pay homage to the late Rick Ocasek, who passed away just a couple of days ago. Rick was known better for being the lead guy in the band, The Cars, but when he wasn't doing that, he was also an amazing producer, an amazing composer, just an overall talented, weird, but incredibly awesome musician. And the fact that he went on to produce this record by this super weird band is simultaneously bizarre yet appropriate. Suicide's first record is a lot more punchy and punky and overall a much more grittier sound than this one. On here, Okasek makes the band sound a lot more cleaner and a lot more dance oriented, which may not be completely appealing to the punks who liked the first record, but it's still Suicide in all their swanky, sexy glory, and it's a great album to listen to. To me, some of the songs on here sound like something off of a Sonic the Hedgehog Sega Genesis soundtrack, which 
huge fan of Sonic, huge fan of video game music, so it's definitely appealing to me. Not to mention that this particular edition has a bonus second disc featuring tapes, rehearsal stuff, all kinds of demos that are probably going to be very raw and very primitive sounding, but it's in the same vein as Suicide, so I mean, I can't imagine it being terrible. Rest in peace, Rick. You will certainly be missed. We love you. Thank you for producing this album. Touch me, touch me. Touch me, touch me. Touch me, touch me. Touch me, touch me. Alrighty then, internet, that does it for me. Hey, if you have any bands or albums you want me to check out, leave a comment down below, and if I like it, maybe I'll include it in another vlog. Also, if you like this video, be sure to go on and hit that subscribe button. It'll show me the support, and I'll love your face for it. And you can also follow me on Instagram for even more music. I post a new album pretty frequently on there, talk a little bit about it, and it gives you a bit of an insight of what else is in my collection. So, thank you all very much for watching. This is Olin from What I'm Listening To, signing out. Goodbye.